Hello friends, and welcome to The Hanged Man in the Moon. If this is your first time here, welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm pleased to meet you. If you've been here before, thank you for returning. I'm truly honored. Friends, let me ask you a question. Do you walk on the wild side? Are you spontaneous? Are you adventurous? Do people look at you and think that's a person who has a lot of fun a lot of the time? Or are you more restrained, more structured? Do you like to follow the rules? Do you like to create order? Do you like to have a routine? The intentional life is a balanced life. It includes both ends of that spectrum. Remember that saying, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy? Well, frankly, all play and no work makes Jack a rather dull boy as well. The party boy, girl, non-binary person, after a while, starts getting a little bit boring. Yeah? Only partying is boring after a while. And living an intentional life is living a life of balance, of alchemy, of combining ends of the spectrum and all parts in between. So, this week's tarot and oracle spread is not going to answer that question for us. We need to answer that question. How balanced is our life? Which end of the spectrum do we favor? Do we favor the adventurous side or the more restrained or sedate side? Each one of us has a natural preference. However, we do want balance. So first we want to find out how balanced are we? Which end of the spectrum do we favor? And when we know that, then this week's tarot and oracle spread is going to give us some advice, some help in what to do. So friends, if you are a returning visitor, you know that this is my, my video series in which I use tarot and oracle spreads to explore topics related to living an intentional life. And I've got a tarot and oracle spread all laid out. Let me give you a peek at it. What did you think of this beautiful spread? It's gorgeous, isn't it? Now, friends, this is the last time you're going to see these cards for a while because at the time that you're watching this, the new moon has come and gone and I have switched out my decks. So, this is the last time for these decks. And if you're curious about which decks they are and who created them. As usual, there will be a short clip at the end of this video which gives you the names of the decks and the creators. And also in the description box below, there will be links if you want to go check out these decks or purchase one or all of them. Remember, I don't get any financial remuneration if you go use these links. They're just there for your convenience. But I recommend you go check out the decks. They really are beautiful. So, if you are a new visitor, let me give you a brief overview of the spread that you just saw. In the center, there are three cards, oracle cards, and they give us the main theme, the thesis statement of this spread. Around the three oracle cards, there are inquiry cards, cards with questions. There are four of those. And laid over those inquiry cards are tarot cards, one for each from two different decks. And those tarot cards answer the question on the inquiry cards. So we've got the whole thing laid out. And as usual, we'll start with the central thesis of the spread, the oracle cards. Let's take a closer look. These three oracle cards show mythical creatures. From the left to right, we have the Dryad, then in the center, the Centaur, which I think is probably the most commonly known of the three, and then to the right, there is the Mandrake. Okay, the Mandrake is not a mythical creature like an animal, but it's a root 
It's the root of a plant, and it's a real plant, it's not a mythical plant. However, the mandrake does show up in mythology in many ways, in many times. So, the creator put the mandrake into this deck as well. So again, we go from the dryad to the centaur to a very real root called the mandrake. Let's start with the dryad. Have you heard of dryads before? The dryads are nymphs. I'm sure you've probably heard of nymphs. Yeah? The dryads are a kind of nymph, a kind of spirit, a sprite. It's a spirit that lives in trees or forests. And it's considered a hermetic uh, nymph because it doesn't leave its, either its tree or its forest. So it stays there. And the dryad is here to remind us about the importance of trees, the importance of plants in our lives. What did we see? We see in this card a human-looking figure that sort of morphs into a plant, has a kind of tree-like structure out of the arms and vines growing up the body. The body seems to be in a dancing or in a sensuous movement of some sort. So the pleasure of being with a tree or the sensual feeling of being in nature and conserving nature as well. Would the dryads conserve or protect their trees or their forest? So this card is reminding us to allow time to be in nature, particularly to allow time to be with or resting under a tree. And the purpose of this, in terms of this card, is for us to receive information. How is that possible? How do we receive information from a tree? Now, you may already have your own answer. How do you understand that idea, receiving information from being underneath a tree? If you have your own understanding of that, that's wonderful. Let me tell you what I believe or what I hear when I see this card, what I understand when I see this card. When I think of trees and our relationship to trees and information, the first thing that pops into my head, probably something you are anticipating right now, is Sir Isaac Newton. There is a story about Sir Isaac Newton sitting underneath a tree, an apple tree, contemplating the physics of the universe. He was a physician, uh, a physics uh, professor, a person who studied physics. And he was contemplating the physics of the universe when an apple drops on his head and he gets a new insight about gravity. Now, frankly, that story is probably pure legend and apocryphal. However, it does show us that when sitting underneath trees, we do receive insights. We do receive information. But how is it possible? Well, there is, ser 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 there is serendipity. Yeah? The serendipity of an apple falling on your head. That's one thing. It could spark an insight, of course. But there are other ways. Humans and plants are part of an ecosystem. And that ecosystem is a cycle of materials and a cycle of energy and a cycle of chemicals. and It's all one ecosystem that we are part of. And when we are close in proximity to a plant, we are closer to the hub of that interaction, the hub of that cycling of stuff both physical, energetic, perhaps non-physical as well. So, let's think of things more on the physical level, right from the beginning. Now, on the physical level, we have air, we have breath. We inhale oxygen and other stuff, but we inhale oxygen and we exhale, along with other stuff, carbon dioxide. Plants absorb carbon dioxide and, in photosynthesis, transmute it into oxygen, which they release and then we take in. 
So there's that cycle, the cycle of breath, the cycle of spirit in a way, because spirit, spiritus, comes from the idea of breath. Being inspired is having the breath of the divine enter you. So there's breath. We share breath. There are also microbes. Yeah? There are microbes that live in and around trees that we absorb that are healthy for us, that stimulate our immune systems and make us stronger. And we shed things that the trees will absorb and make them stronger. Now, there's a cycle of material stuff as well. There's a cycle of energy. Now, trees emit, as well as other plants, but we're focusing on trees right now. Trees emit energy. We emit energy. Our energy moves and combines and shifts and circulates. There are ions. Trees create ions that we can benefit from. So there's a cycle of energy, matter, breath, all of that. And when we're closer to that interaction, to the hub of that interaction, we tend to relax more. Have you ever been in a forest and smelled that fresh smell? And as you smelled that fresh smell, notice that a lot of the tension in your body began to relax. The tension in your mind began to relax. We open, or we have a greater chance of opening when we are in nature and interacting with nature or sitting underneath a tree. Because when we're back in our less natural world, our man-made world of of buildings and structures and organizations and work, when we're in that arena of the human made, we oftentimes close off to, from the energy of the planet and also from the powerful force of our intention because of stress, because of tension, because things aren't going exactly the way we hoped they would, they would go, or because we feel we have to protect ourselves or because we think we've got a lot to do and our minds are busy, active, trying to figure things out, and so we shut ourselves off from external perception. And also from internal perception. Now it all goes into ego mind. Rational mind. But there's so much more intelligence beyond the rational mind, and I think we all know that. And when we're underneath a tree, when we're sit seated underneath a tree, and relaxed, our bodies begin to relax, and then our emotions begin to relax, and our minds begin to relax. And as we are relaxed, as we open more, as our spirit opens more, we can then re regain our fuller connection to the infinite beings that we actually are. We get, begin to receive information from our eternal selves, from the divine, creator of all of this universe. All of that is much more available to us as we are more open to it. And we're also more open to other synchronicities. Yeah, a bird flies by and it sparks a memory or a leaf falls and we remember something or a feeling arises from within and that sparks another flow of information, a flow of ideas, flow of thoughts, flows of feelings, and we receive more information or more information begins to come together to alchemize, to become something new. And when we're open, all of that is so much more possible. And being underneath a tree, being in nature, is a wonderful heightening of the possibility of being open. And that's what this dryad is here to remind us of. Spend time in nature, spend time underneath a tree, interacting with a tree, to open to information. Now, right now for me, it's winter. It's towards the end of winter, but it's cold outside. There is still snow on the ground. Spending a lot of time underneath a tree would be very uncomfortable. However, even a brief period, a few minutes, would be helpful. 
So that's what I'm going to do and what I try to do. So that's the first message for these three cards. Spend some time underneath a tree to receive, to receive information, to receive knowledge, understanding. And then we move right into the centaur. Now the centaur, what is the centaur? The centaur is a creature, a being, that is half-ish human and half-ish horse. Looks to me more horse than human, but let's call it half and half. Half human, half horse. And the centaur is traditionally, in mythology, known as a creature that struggles to balance its natures. You know, it's got this human nature and it's got this horse nature, and in mythology that it would be the civilized and the uncivilized, the wild and the tame, and what, needing to balance those aspects of self. We need to be expressions of both aspects of that self. When we are unbalanced, when we are too much in the human or too much in the animal, we are unbalanced. And when we are unbalanced, we are closed off from a lot of the power of our intention. We want to be balanced. We want to be full beings of both civilization and instinct, or superego and id, to put it in more psychological terms. Conscious and unconscious. We want a good balance of all of that. We don't want to cut any part of that off. And the centaur is here to remind us to do that. To, to take a moment, to pause, to see, are we in balance? Not that one is better than the other. Are we in balance? And if so, how can we correct that balance? How can we shift ourselves closer to the end of the spectrum that we tend to ignore? And this is where the mandrake comes into play. The mandrake. The mandrake is a medicinal herb, or well, a medicinal root, I should say, um, that can be used for traditional medicines as a, it's a kind of narcotic uh, it can help to numb the nerves, especially when things like surgical procedures are being done. Um, it can also be a bit of an anesthetic. Yeah, it can knock you out. But it has both good and bad qualities in mythology. It can be a benefit, a charm, and it can be a poison and of a curse. So this card is here to remind us to think before we act. Are we, is our next planned action going to be for the benefit of us and others or the detriment of us and others? Is it going to be a blessing or is it going to be a curse? And this is a perfect card to follow the centaur. Because after we've sat, we've considered, we've noticed how which area is of our lives is perhaps out of balance. When we go to move back into balance, we want to course correct. We want to do a little bit of reflection of how we are going to course correct. For example, let's take somebody who has been spending too much time or too much of their life in the wild side, spontaneous, um, uh, parties, uh, adventure, not enough structure, not enough focused work, all play. And that person realizes, oh my God, I've left this entire part of myself wither. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and I'm going to become a certified public accountant. Yeah, I'm going to get a job in an office and sit there with a calculator doing numbers all day. That will give me that structure. There are movies about people who do something like this and they're always doomed to failure because they've, yeah, they've gone in the opposite direction, but they haven't considered whether the direction that they've chosen is actually the direction that matches themselves. Yeah? They think of the stereotypical structured life and they go for that rather than the structure that actually suits them. Or there's another way of going, yeah? There's the the um, timid, 
person who always follows the rules and always obeys and has a very routine life, and that person realizes that their life has been too limited and they want to break out and become the, the spontaneous enjoyer of life and adventure and they go off and they do something wild and crazy and, and there are movies about people like that too and they are doomed to failure because they haven't considered what they've, whether what they've chosen is actually a match to them. Now sometimes some movies they eventually find their match after some mishaps but they did not take the time to really consider what less structured activities would actually match them, their personalities, their desires, their interests. Reflection is required. Reflection is asked for. And the Mandrake is here to remind us that once we've noticed the, that we are out of balance and we want to course correct, what will be the next step? What is the next step that really is of benefit for us? We don't just want to shoot for the stereotypical answer that other people have shown us in the past. We want to find the one that is correct for us. We want to perhaps find the less structured activity that actually interests us. We want to find the adventure that actually matches what we really want to try. And it might take time to do, to discover that, but we've always got a tree to sit under for that, for that discovery process. Rather than leaping without reflection into something that probably will not match us, taking time to reflect, taking time to realize what we actually want to do to balance ourselves out. Does that make sense? Have you seen any of those movies where somebody goes off and does something wild and disaster or at least calamity, temporary as it sometimes is, follows? So, that's what these three cards is trying to remind us of. Take some time. Be with nature. Reflect on the balance of our lives, especially structure versus spontaneity. And then be very discerning about how we course correct, how we return to balance. Now we have four questions to ask of this central oracle spread. Let's move on to that first question. The first question, what could be a more perfect question? What is the next step? Well, what is the next step? We have two cards answering that question. The first one is the High Priestess, and the one right beside it is the Ace of Pentacles. Wonderful, wonderful response to that question. Let's start off with the High Priestess, because this card is a little bit... The image on this card is a little bit surprising. Did you take a close look at that card? Does it look like a High Priestess to you? Um, it doesn't, it barely looks like a human being to me, which might be appropriate for the High Priestess. The High Priestess is the one who is in charge of that liminal space between the conscious mind and the unconscious mind, between the rational world and the irrational world, between the human civilization and the spiritual wisdom between the divine and the profane, in some ways, yeah? And maybe that being is not necessarily a human being, but a being, a part human, part spiritual being, or, I don't know. When I look at this card, I see something that might be out of Doctor Who. <laughs> it looks a little bit like those, those round robots. I forget what they're called. I think it starts with a D. Yeah, it looks like a watercolor of one of those things, in a way. We, I, we don't even see a face. We see where the face would be. There's like this blurry circle. And it looks like there might be an, uh, an arm, maybe, holding something. It looks like there might be a leg. 
like this creature is sitting on the ground with one leg, the right leg maybe trailing off to the, to the left. It looks like it might be somehow slightly humanoid, but this is our High Priestess from this deck. And it's the card of intuition. It's the card of sacred knowledge, of the Divine Feminine. And this kind of could be a, a feminine card if you want to believe in feminine masculine. Um, personally, I don't. I don't believe of it as feminine masculine because of the way that we relate feminine and female, masculine and male. Now, I wish we had different words. Um, I believe there's a spectrum of receptive and um, giving of passive and active, I think, which are not necessarily the same, yeah? Receptive can be active. Giving can be passive. Now, they're not all lined up the same, but there are scales, or there are um, continuums. Yeah? There are spectrums of states, hot and cold. So I believe in that. I think the words feminine and masculine might be a little bit unfor are a little bit unfortunate. But she, this creature, she, this creature, this being, is on the intuitive side, the receptive side. And in, the, in this being, the intuitive side is also the receptive side, is also the soft side, it's also the watery side. Um, the sub subconscious mind. Now, the High Priestess is also the gatekeeper, guardian, not for me. Um, the one, the guide to the subconscious mind. The High Priestess is also the one of clairvoyance. So, what is the next step? Her, the first answer, the first part of the answer is reflection, is opening up to that sacred wisdom, which is what that whole set of three cards was just about, was just telling us, right? To open up to the sacred wisdom that we have access to at all times. The High Priestess is also the card of perceptivity, that perception that we have when we're sitting underneath the tree or in the woods or out in nature connection to that, and allowing ourselves to be open to the knowledge, the wisdom that we can receive from there. And then right next to the High Priestess, we have the Ace of Pentacles. And in this card, we have a rabbit. Okay, <laughs> rabbits, fine. That makes sense a little bit. The Pentacles are an earth suit. The rabbit is an earth animal, certainly. Um, new opportunities. Manifestation, abundance, the beginnings of abundance. Not the fullness of abundance, but the beginnings, the energy of abundance. It's the card of investment as well. Investing in ourselves, investing in our growth, investing in time and energy and attention in our balance. The Ace of Pentacles which flows from our connection with our unconscious, with our divine, with our ancestral wisdom from the High Priestess, comes that opportunity for abundance, for growth, for new opportunities, for new chances in the direction that we have perhaps left to, to wither for a while. So what is the first step? We connect with the knowledge that we have, we have connection to, but we've been not so much suppressing, but ignoring or not noticing. Now we reconnect and open to that information and we will receive or we will find, discover, create, manifest new opportunities to balance ourselves. Whichever direction that is, be it the wild or the tame. Let's take a look at the second question.
It's amazing how these two first two questions, which flow so naturally from the three oracle cards, were answered so perfectly in harmony with the three oracle cards. So this question is, what is my intention? Yeah? What is my next step? What is my intention? What is my intention that flows with and from that first step? Or that guides that first step? What is my intention? And we have two cards. The first one is the Four of Swords and the second one is Strength. Now, the Four of Swords. In a Rider Waite Smith deck, you would normally see a tomb inside of a mausoleum, perhaps, of a knight. And there would be three swords up above the tomb. You'd see the effigy of the knight on the tomb and then one sword on the side of what looks like a coffin. And there's also a stained glass window up on the side with a pox written in it. If you look at Pixie's art, you will see pox, peace, written in the stained glass window. Here we have something different. Here we have what looks like a, a, a female figure to me, not necessarily, but it looks like a female figure to me, um, lying on the ground in a very unhappy position, um, not necessarily dead, but definitely not very happy looking to me. And there are four swords pointing down towards her from above, if this is a female figure. And what do we get from this? Typically, this is the card of rest. Oh, it looks like she could be resting. She could just be there taking a nap, I suppose. Um, it's the card of uh, relaxation. It's the card of um, meditation for some. The card of contemplation, of reflection. And that's a perfect answer. That is my intention, to take some time out, to reflect, to contemplate, to meditate, to understand who I am. It could be the card of recuperation and repose and recovery, because when we are out of balance, we need to recover that side that has been neglected. We need to recover and recuperate to get ourselves back into balance. And the first step to that recovery and recuperation would be contemplation. Again, sitting under a tree. So right next to that, we have the strength card. Beautiful answer. Strength. Now, usually in the Rider Waite Smith, in Pixie's art, we'd see a, a woman standing up next to a lion. Um, and it would look as though the woman were, or the woman has tamed the lion. The woman has made the lion bend to her will. I see it as more of a balanced relationship than that. Not one being in control of the other, but the two finding an interrelationship, a connection, a way of being together. So that one is not afraid of the other, that one doesn't need to control the, the other, but both work in harmony with each other. So for me, that is strength. Strength. Courage. Yeah? That courage is not something that we are controlling. That courage is something that helps us. That the lion, the courage, rises up from within to allow us to do what we want to do in the face of some, perhaps, created fears. It's the card of um, persuasion and of influence. And when we are in full balance, when we have all aspect of, aspects of ourselves working together, we have great influence over others. Now we are then aligned. We are aligned within ourselves and we are then at once aligned with the fullness of our eternal selves and with the divine. And when we are in that aligned state, we have great influence over many people and situations. 
It's the card of compassion. It's the card of fortitude and security. Because when we are whole, we feel secure. It's when we are split, when we're divided, that we feel unstable, unbalanced, insecure. But we are when we are whole, when we are aligned, we are secure, we're stable. And that's what this card is here to remind us. That this is our intention, to be whole, to be open, to be aligned. To have that human and horse part working together, balanced. Now in this card, what do we see? I don't know if you could see this, but in this card we have the lion and we have the woman. The lion is much easier to see. The woman is there at the lion's side, kind of reaching up from below, which seems a little bit out of balance to me, frankly speaking. Um, but we have both figures here as well. So what is my intention? My atten intention is to pause, to take a moment, to reflect, to contemplate, to meditate, and come into that alignment which gives me strength and gives me balance. And is again repeating the, th the statement, the thesis statement of the three oracle cards at the beginning of this spread, right? Does that make sense? Do you see that? How both of these questions and answers both echo the oracle cards. So this is a very strong message for us, that balance of all aspects of ourselves is very important and very healthful and very stabilizing. Even in our adventures, even in our madcap escapades, we still can be balanced and grounded, safe, secure. While we're having fun, while we're being spontaneous, being safe and secure does not preclude spontaneity or whimsy or fun. Whimsy and fun does not necessarily have to equate with danger. It can be a very stable, very secure kind of play as well. Now, security, structure, doesn't always mean routine either. And so that's something we want to investigate for ourselves and within ourselves. We have a third question to move on to. Let's do that. The third question is, what's the joke? <clears throat> and I always get a little bit unsettled when this question comes up because it's not a question that I enjoy asking. What's the joke? I mean, I enjoy jokes. I enjoy humor. But this seems a little bit, I don't know, What's the joke seems a little bit um, uh, ironic, a little bit satirical, in kind of in an unhelpful way. What's the joke? That kind of, I get that kind of feeling when I see this card. It's, I'm sure it's not the intention of the creator. But I get that feeling, so I always feel a little bit eh, unsettled when it comes up. And the two answers we get are the Eight of Cups and the Queen of Swords. And I think these two work together perfectly. So what is the joke? The joke is the beginning Eight of Cups. The Eight of Cups, in the Rider Waite Smith cards, you remember, it's a person walking away from Eight Cups, which are closer to the viewer of the card. The person is walking away in the dark, towards perhaps a bridge crossing a river to a castle, perhaps, but definitely walking away from the Eight Cups. This is a card of disappointment, a card of abandonment sometimes. And that person seems to be abandoning those cups, disappointed with those cups. This didn't go the way I wanted it to. I'm unhappy. I want to leave. This is not it. This is no. Yeah? So what is the joke? The joke, I believe, is that we can walk away. We really can walk away. And if we are walking away in disappointment, we're not walking away. We're carrying it with us. 
we have the power to actually leave it there and walk away. But we usually don't. We usually take whatever is, has disappointed us, made us feel uh, dissatisfied, upset, um, angry, uh, hurt. We take that with us and often bring it out as a badge of courage. This is the pain that I have suffered. This is the horrible life that I have lived. Now, what I'm saying is not the same as, um, what, are we, what are we calling it now? <laughs> We're calling it um, bypassing, spiritual bypassing. That's different. That is different. Spiritual bypassing or a toxic positivity, that's the other one, is when you have these horrible, bad, unhappy experiences and you bury them and put on a layer, a shellacking, a whitewash of, interesting we call it whitewash, a whitewash of smiles and sunshine, pretending like it either never happened or that you weren't affected by it, that it wasn't important that you are now happy, joyful, and free. That is sh sugarcoating, whitewashing, all that, this white stuff, um, spiritual bypassing, toxic, po toxic positivity. That's not what I'm talking about. Because that's not actually leaving the thing behind. I'm actually talking about leaving the thing behind so that that feeling of sunshine and roses and happiness isn't something we're trying to use as a tool to bury something else, but something that springs forth from a heart that is now free of that. We have the potential, the possibility of letting that stuff actually go. We really do. And maybe we can't do it on our own. Maybe we do need help. And it's okay to get help. It's good to get help. Please, if we need help, we get the help. Definitely better than trying to cover up the pain with false smiles and a false sense of hope because that is a very, very thin crust that will break when all of that repressed negativity explodes and it will explode if repressed for too long it's like it's like oh there's a kind of bomb that where pressure is increased and it's increased and it, it increased and then it explodes like a supernova like a star explodes into a supernova there's so much pressure so much pressure collapses and collapses and collapses until the pressure is too great and it explodes that's what happens with toxic positivity and um, spiritual bypassing. You don't bypass it. We actually really honestly have want to let it go. Forgive what we can forgive for ourselves, not for them. And we have the potential, the possibility of doing that. And that's the joke. And a lot of the times our lack of balance, our moving so much to structure, or moving so much to play and a wild life can be a way of avoiding that eight of cups, that stuff that we don't want to let go. So we try to protect ourselves with either structure or with a false sense of freedom. And to regain that balance, first we may need to let go. And that's what the joke is. All we need to do is let it go. We don't have to fix it. We don't have to change it. We don't have to get dig into it and make it change into something else. Because that's not going to happen. Because it doesn't exist anymore. It's just a replayed tape. But we want to let go. And we can do that because the next card, because Queen of Swords, 
Queen of Swords, beautiful card. This Queen of Swords is a much softer Queen of Swords than my Queen of Swords. My Queen of Swords is much more radiant with power. My Queen of Swords is glowing with independence and clear clarity of mind. Now the Queen of Swords to me is the independent person. It's the one of un of clear judgment. There's an unword buried in my mind somewhere. It's not coming out. Um, of okay, so that, again, the Queen of Swords is the card of the independent person. The clear judgment, the unbiased judgment, maybe that was it, the unbiased judgment. Someone of clear boundaries. We can have boundaries and still be balanced with spontaneity and structure. We can have boundaries. It's the card of direct communication and the card of the knowing one, the astute one, the educated one, which we all are in one way or another. We are all educated. We all are all astute in our own way. And the Queen of Swords is all of that. And it's that quality that allows us to be able to let it go. Allows us to cut the ties that bind us to the past. The past disappointments, the past pain, the past frustrations, the past feelings of powerlessness. Picking up our swords as the queen allows us to be the independent thinkers and cut the ties that are chaining us to some past that is not serving us. And that's the joke. We can do it. We have the tools. Maybe we need a refresher course on how to use the tools, but we have the tools. We can do it. So that is what the joke is. We have a fourth question. Let's take a look at that. The fourth question is, what am I curious about? Which is something that is moving us in the direction of the future. But before we move into the future, let's do a quick recap. Now, we started with the three oracle cards, which told us to take a moment, take time, pause, reflect, open ourselves to our inner knowing, and consider how balanced we are. We're all out of balance in one way or another. There's no perfect balance as human beings in this world. We're all out of balance in some way or another. So look to where we're out of balance. Consider how we're going to rectify that balance, bring ourselves closer to balance. Now it's always a juggling act, a little bit this, a little bit that, a little overcorrection here, a little overcorrection here. It's always a balancing act. But we want to consider how we're going to rebalance this time. We don't want to just leap ahead into, well, everybody else does that, so I'll do this. Or I've seen this, I'll do this. Or, what's that? I'll go there. Now, we want to consider. We want to pause after we've made our decision. How, what is our, my next step? And that was the next question. What is my next step? To, again, get in tune, get in line, get in alignment. Open ourselves to our inner knowing. And find the opportunity. Make the opportunity. And so the next question is, what is my intent? My intent is to take the time and to realign myself. Yeah, both the, anim the more instinctual and the more rational sides of myself. And then the third question was, what's the joke? The joke is all that stuff that keeps me out of balance, I can let it go. And I have the mental acuity to be able to do it. So what am I curious about? I'm curious, apparently, about Six of Wands and the Emperor, which is interesting, especially in combination. The Six of Wands. Here we see a person, and we do see Six Wands. Yeah? They're a little bit difficult to see. It looks like there might be a horse being ridden by the person, which is interesting because we just had a centaur here. We had another horse and person combination. 
But the Six of Swords, in this card and in the Rider Waite Smith uh, Pixies art, we have a person uh, seated on a horse with a laurel wreath, and there are people around holding up wands, cheering them on. It's the victory march. Yeah? So, a card of success, of victory. And I'm curious about that. I'm curious about victory. I'm curious about success. I'm curious about public recognition, being recognized for the things that I have accomplished. I'm curious about that. It's not something that I'm after, that I'm chasing, that I need to feel um, <clears throat> fulfilled or feel like I am um, seen. But it's something that I'm curious about. What is that like? What, is, what would it be like to feel that? It's the card of self-confidence. And what would self-confidence be like for me? I'm curious about that. I've got a certain amount of self-confidence now, but what would that level of self-confidence feel like? How would I be as that self-confident person? And I'm curious about that. And I'm also curious about, once I've felt that, what power that would bring for me. Not over others, but for me. Can you see the difference between that? The emperor, the right side card, the emperor. A lot of people don't like the emperor, a lot of people don't like the hierophant, but the emperor, there's a positive way of seeing the emperor. The emperor is the card of authority. The card of structure and establishment and government. Also the card for me of active creativity, yeah? Going out in the world and making something with our hands, doing stuff. My heater just turned off. Um, so it might get cold here. Uh, the, the emperor, authority. And a lot of people don't like that authority because they see it as authority over them instead of recognizing their own authority, their own power, their own ability to create structure for themselves, for their lives, for the activities they want to do. Establishment. We don't want to start every new phase of our life from ground zero. We build on what we have already established for ourselves. That's the life of the emperor. We are, our, we are all our own emperors in some way. We are the masters of our universes because your universe is different from my universe. And you are the master of your universe and I am the master of my universe. And our universes often will interact and influence each other and overlap each other and grow within each other. And we are each the, the emperor of each of our universes. So what would that like? What would that experience be? To be recognized? To feel that confidence in front of and among other people? And to feel the power of being the emperor of my universe? What does that feel like? How would I express myself as that being? in balance, having both structure and play, routine and spontaneity. Yeah. Super conscious rules, unconscious libido desires, all of that together in one balanced I'm doing this because I'm thinking of Yin Yang, or in Korean, Um Yang, the, the Tao. That balance and cycle of aspects, the spectrum that is wrapped in within itself and dances within itself. And the spontaneity within the structure and the structure within the spontaneity. And the active within the passive and the passive within the active. What would that feel like? How would I be as a me doing that? And that's the direction we want to move in. And the way we move in, in that direction is with curiosity. By sniffing it out and, as, and, try, and trying it on from time to time. 
Now, like we might try on a new suit of clothes or a new dress or a new outfit of some kind, trying it on from time to time until it becomes our natural habit, our natural habit, like a, a nun's or a monk's habit, <laughs> our natural wardrobe. And when we are that, we are the fullness of ourselves, I think. Does that make sense to you? And when we are the fullness of ourselves, we are flowing top speed with the flow of our intention. Because we are our intention. We merge with the river of intention and we're going with it. And there will still be times when we cut ourselves off, sure. But once we've had the experience of that balance, even as momentary as it might be, once we've had that feel experience of balance, maybe an enlightened moment, a moment of enlightenment, we can return to it. And the more we return to it, the easier it is to return to it. Enjoying the times when we go out of balance, because it, that makes, can make life interesting. So friends, if that makes sense to you, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear if this means something to you. Now, in the comments below, let me know. Which side of the spectrum do you tend to live in? Do you tend to live more in, in structure, in rules, or do you tend to live more in whimsy and uh, spontaneity and um, <clears throat> following the moment? How do you balance yourself when you notice that you've gone too far or been too long at one or the other end of that spectrum? How do you do it? Do you sit under trees? Let me know. So, I'd like to hear from you in the comments below. And like the video if you got this far, definitely hit that like button so I know that you've watched. Um, I'd love to see who's watched. Uh, subscribe to my channel if you haven't subscribed yet. And hit the alarm bell so you get notifications of when I upload videos. I'll be uploading a second video this week. Um, the extension of this video which uses Tarot de Marseille. Uh, share this anywhere you think you would like to share this to show to other people. And comment below. I really would love to hear from you. And remember, in just a moment, there will be a short clip which will show you the names of the decks and who created them. And again, there are links below if you want to go purchase one or all of them on your own. And friends, today, now, and always, I wish you love, joy, well-being, and pure awareness. Thank you. Mm -hmm.